It's the new season on Sunday morning, and here again is Charles Osgood. Songs such as Glory Days have made him a musical legend. Bruce Springsteen has been singing about his own life and times for some 40 years. Now at last, he's written about it as well. Here once again is our music man, Anthony Mason. In the final dates of his international tour that ended this past week, Bruce Springsteen played one four-hour gig after another. How do you keep doing that? I'm conditioned to do it from many, many years of experience. Don't try it at home, kids. <laughs> It's the one arena where the singer, who turns 67 this week, can control the clock. You're looking for a particular moment, and then when you catch that, it feels so good sometimes, then time disappears. physically tired though it's amazing how you can do it every night when you're when you're called to we met on the singer's moment. new jersey farm recently at the recording studio he built there where do you think your drive comes from i believe every artist has someone who told them that they weren't worth dirt and someone who told them that were they were the second coming of the baby jesus and they believed them both and that's that's the fuel that stirs the fire <laughs> for springsteen the fire started in Freehold, New Jersey. Give me the geography. Where was home? Home was right up here. Yeah. On the block around the St. Rose of Lima Catholic Church. My house was here. Church was there. My aunt's house was there. Uh -huh. My other aunt's house is right next to her. Uh -huh. The grinding, hypnotic power of this ruined place would never leave me, he writes in Born to Run. His new autobiography, published by Simon & Schuster, a division of CBS. Doug and Adele Springsteen's son found both comfort and fear here. His mother, a legal secretary, rented him his first guitar. His father, who worked at Ford, was an angry man. He loved me, Springsteen writes, but couldn't stand me. <laughs> My feelings exactly. <laughs> we made a surprise visit to the school at St. Rose of Lima. I'm getting the willies. Go, my friend. He's beloved here now. We look great. It was different when he was in class. How did you do when you were here? Uh, not particularly well, you know. I was, uh, I didn't fit in the box so well. Did I read that they called you springy? Yes, that is correct, my friend. <laughs> Amongst many other things. Long after he moved away, Springsteen would drive back at times to Freehold. I may still cruise through every once in a while. <laughs> what are you looking for when you do? Uh, well, they say... <laughs> they say you're looking to make things all right again, you know? And, of course, there's no going back, you know? The long-haired guitar slinger who earned his stripes in the bars of Asbury Park was just 22 when he was signed to Columbia Records. His first two albums did not sell well. So he poured his soul into a new song called Born to Run. You were reaching for something epic. Well, I was trying to make the greatest record you'd ever heard the record that after you heard it you didn't have to hear another record yeah. you know? born to run launched bruce springsteen the album's now iconic cover also featured sax player clarence clemens Bruce's mythic sidekick, the big man's imposing presence, came to symbolize the brotherhood of the E Street Band. How would you describe your relationship with Clarence? 
it was uh, very primal, you know. It was just, oh, mm, you're, you're some missing part of me. You're mm. some dream I'm having. <laughs> such this huge force you know mm -hmm. while at the same time being very fragile and very dependent himself which is maybe what the two of us had in common we were both kind of insecure down inside and we both felt kind of fragile and sure of ourselves but when we were together we felt really powerful so we're very different people yeah you know uh, Clients live fast and loose and wild and wide open, you know? Yeah. I tend to be a little more conservative. You said offstage you, you couldn't be friends. I said, I, no, I couldn't, I couldn't, be, it would ruin my life. I said, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but Clarence could be Clarence excellently. <laughs> he was very good at it. Until his health began a long decline. In 2011, Clemens suffered a stroke and died days later. Losing Clarence, Springsteen writes, was like losing the rain. And it happened very quick and suddenly and it was quite devastating. I mean, when something like that, that, that as you say, kind of came magically to begin with, yeah. goes away, I mean, right. you've got to be sitting there going, how do I replace this? There's no replacing Clarence. You know, you're going to do something else. <laughs> Clarence had mentioned he had a sax-playing nephew, Jake Clemens. Springsteen turned to him to resolve the band's identity crisis. When you saw this was finally working, was it a relief? To oh, yeah, are you kidding? <laughs> it, was like, it was like the weight of the world was off my shoulders, you uh -huh. know? Said, but Springsteen oh. faced an even greater challenge as he entered his 60s, a crippling attack of depression that he'd battle with the help of his wife and East Street band member, Patty Scalfa. It lasted for a long time. My 60s it would last for a year, and then it would slip away, then it would come back for a year and a half. Do you see it coming? Do you feel it coming? Mm, not really, you know. It sneaks up on you. It's like this thing that engulfs you. I got to where I didn't want to get out of bed, you know, and... and and you're not behaving very well at home and you're tough on everybody hopefully not the kids i just try to hide it from the kids but you know patty really had to work with me through it and she was her strength and the love she had was uh, very important you know as far as guiding me through it she said well you're gonna be okay maybe not today <laughs> or tomorrow but it's gonna be all right I mean, you still function with it. Effectively. Yeah, the, my, my thing is, for some reason, it never affected my work or any of my playing. You know, it yeah. was something, if I was dead down, when I came in the studio, I could work. Springsteen, who wrote about it in the song This Depression, finally got through it with therapy and medication. This is my His late father also suffered from mental illness, and much of Springsteen's book is an attempt to write a new ending to their relationship. Yeah, my dad was very important in it because I felt I hadn't been completely fair to him in my music. How did you feel that you were unfair in your music? I think that I'd left a, an image of him as sort of this very domineering uh, character, which he could be at different times, and yeah. he could be frightening. But he was also much, much more. He had a much more complicated life. He describes an unannounced visit his father made to see him just days before the first of his three children was born. What did he say to you? That... Oh, <laughs> you're going to get me now, man. Uh, he showed up at my door, and he came in, and uh, we had a couple of beers. It was early in the morning, and uh, I think he said, yeah, you know, you've been really good to us. I said, yeah. I said, I wasn't so good to you. I said, well, well, you did the best you could, you know? And uh, that was it. That was that was the only recognition I needed of our history. You know, it was a little was, thing, but it was everything? It was, it was a small thing, but it was everything. It was, 
they changed our relationship immediately. It was just a lovely gift, and it was a lovely uh, epilogue to our relationship, you know, it really was. The relationship Bruce Springsteen has with his fans is deep and enduring. I'm still uh, in love with playing, and, and my attitude at this point in my life is this is what I love to do. I want to do as much of it as I can. Again and again on this tour, he played his longest shows ever in the U.S. Around four hours every night. You could play for just two and a half hours, you know? I suppose I could. <laughs> nah. <laughs>